What's up everybody, NEXT here, coming to you today from the rarely seen Temple of El Tau. What's up everybody, NEXT here, back with another Adept Expedition. Welcome to the channel, and if you are new here, please subscribe now for more videos like this one. Today, we are going to explore a site you've never seen before. An ancient Egyptian site you've probably never even heard of before this video. So I'd like to introduce you to these temple ruins that few eyes have ever seen. And you won't find a more in-depth video exploring these ruins anywhere else here on YouTube. This is an archaeological site that often gets left out of the mix of mentions when referencing temples here where I live in Luxor. And I find this to be very unfortunate. It's actually a bit tragic because this is one of the oldest sites in all of Luxor. And not only does this site date all the way back to the Old Kingdom of Egypt, but it houses an incredible treasure containing unusual out-of-place artifacts which are not Egyptian in origin. Artifacts from an unknown epoch and from an unknown civilization. Welcome to the Temple of Tou. Located east bank of the River Nile, about 28 kilometers south of Luxor, you're about to see a site few tourists ever visit. Nobody comes here, Lizzie. I don't think anybody comes here. As you enter the site, you suddenly find yourself in the company of a small display of artifacts, which make up an assortment of fragmentary blocks from the Old Kingdom and later structures. Here, we see the face of Hathor. Mom, under the rock. It was really amazing to see so many bits and pieces, many with hieroglyphs etched into the stone just laying around like this, just begging to be put back together again, like an ancient stone jigsaw puzzle. Oh yeah. Wow. This must have been one amazing place. Oh, the grind, like mortal and pestis. Saying to use it to grind up in here. Oh, this was a ceiling. Yeah, this was a ceiling. You have all the stars. Wow. Notice the stars, a common recurring motif often found on the ceilings of Egyptian tombs. For ancient Egyptians, a star was called a seba, and it was one of the most significant Egyptian symbols, which implied a deeply profound understanding of not only astronomy, but the veiled connection between humanity and the cosmos. The Egyptologists tell us the symbol is also associated with doorways and gates, hence a stargate, allowing a connection to be established. For the ancient Egyptians, Stars also symbolize the souls of the departed. It was a symbol of the followers of the Netra Osiris, a Greek rendering of the ancient Usur, who symbolizes the divine and mortal form. Osiris is the personification of physical creation and its cycles of becoming and return, death and renewal. He was the lord of the cycles of creation. Osiris is associated with the moon and with numbers 7, 14, and 28, relating to the physical lunar cycles. 
but when looking through an esoteric lens, takes on a more metaphysical dimension as the conceptions of cosmic process. And at the same time, Osir, Osiris, was also a solar principle, Ra or Re, after he had descended beneath the earth, the invisible sun that illuminates the moon. From a symbolist perspective, Osiris represents the principle of mortal man carrying within himself the potentiality of spiritual salvation. And it was through this unseen connection extending from earth to sky that one would become a star, a Seba. There is a nod to this in Disney's Lion King where Simba is told to look up at the stars to see his ancestors in the sky. The Lion King is actually a modern retelling of the Osirian myth and contentions of Horus and Set. Walt Disney was a member of the Rosicrucian Order Amorc and was well educated in both Western esoteric and ancient Egyptian principles. Like many ancient traditions, the Egyptians studied the night sky taking measurements from the stars to accurately align their pyramids and sun temples with the Earth's four cardinal points. They would intentionally align their pyramids and temples toward the north for the Per'ah, Pharaoh, because they believed he or she would become a star in the northern sky after they transitioned from their human experience. To assure that a king would join the circumpolar stars, the pyramids were laid out facing due north toward the indestructible stars. This vital heritage of the ancient Egyptians to date has remained veiled, but they had a complete science unlike our own which the esoteric tradition refers to as the sacred science. But our modern science today does not recognize this connection, this energetic bridge between earth and sky. It is yet to be fully ascertained. It's very interesting seeing it in the bits because, you know, you can see more of how it's put together. What more stars here? Some complete ruins. Bits and pieces everywhere. Sayek, hello. Huh? Coptic. This side all Coptic. Shokran. Yeah, pottery all over the ground here. He said this side is all Coptic, Coptic, Coptic Christian. So the keeper has just informed us that this section is made up of Coptic pieces, which are a lot of the smaller pieces we'll see in a moment. I noticed this larger megalithic piece cut from a single block of granite that would suggest we have an Old Kingdom presence in this pile. He's taking us to show us a cartouche oh, yeah. now. Oh yeah, that's, that's Temple. impressive. Oh, two piece. So... Usur Saka Us Usur Saka The name in the cartouche etched into stone is Usurka, the ancient Egyptian pharaoh who founded the fifth dynasty, which followed the fourth dynasty pyramid builders at Giza. Now while the identity of his parents is uncertain, some Egyptologists believe that he may be the son of Menkare or Menkara, depending on how you want to pronounce it, but the pharaoh that built the third and smallest pyramid at Giza. We can't say with certainty, but we do know that there's a direct lineage between Userkaf and the fourth dynasty pharaohs. And this is the pharaoh who built a pyramid beside Djoser at Saqqara. What is certain 
is that this granite pillar represents evidence of Old Kingdom architecture here in Luxor, which is mostly known for its New Kingdom sites built on top of Middle Kingdom ruins. This tells us that Userkaf came here to Luxor, known to the Greeks as Thebes, but back then it was called Ancient Was, and he set up this chapel to honor the falcon-headed god of war, Montu. I, uh, stars for the roof. <laughs> wow, here's another big chunk of the roof. All dilapidated, wow. And we know it's the roof because we can see the stars. Neck bed. Known today by its modern name in Arabic, El Taud, which comes from the Coptic Taut, which comes from the Latin Tofuin, meaning for the Greeks, Crocodopolis, which is derived from the ancient Egyptian Jehurti. How do you say it? Uh, El Taud? Taud. The name, Taud, temple name, Taud. Taud. The surviving monuments here at Taud are New Kingdom and later. However, a larger temple by Tutmosis III is believed to be outside the walls of the ruins under a mosque in the modern village. Wow, you can see the foundation, Liz. Uh, no, uh, water. water? Maya? Maya? Maya, come up. Uh, ah. We are now approaching a yeah. Ptolemaic and Roman period temple that was built by Ptolemy VIII and consists of a column court and hall with various chambers, including a hidden treasury oh. in the room above the chapel on the south side of the hall. Let's go check it out. Here we have some of the roof still intact. You can see the stars. There's a band of friezes of Hathor running. Hepedu, Hathor band, column of Hathor heads running along the top. It's Ptolemaic. Temple building text. Here we can see the Netcher to whom this temple is consecrated, making this temple here at Taut the Temple of Mantu. Seeing it for the first time helps us to reimagine the experience of Jean-Francois Champollion. When he laid his eyes upon this relief for the first time, he was able to ascertain the temple's consecration to Montu. He says, and I quote, On 7 March, we visited the ruins of the ancient Tufium, now Taud, situated on the right bank of the river, but in the vicinity of the Arabic chain and very near to Hermontis, which is on the opposite bank. 
Here there are two or three little apartments of a temple inhabited by Falaz or their cattle. In the largest, there are still some base reliefs which inform me that a triad worshipped in a temple consisted of Mantu, the goddess Ritho, and their son Hophre, the same as in the temple of Hermonthus, the capital of Nome to which Tufium belonged. Unquote. Wing, a keep bird, which means all the people worshipped here, all to adore, connect. Men. How men come up to men here? Right there, he's showing me you have men. Okay, so we just moved from the temple. I was right there and I came over here. And you can see the mine, well, water, all water here. This would have all been part of the lake right here. The inundation, the rising, and the descending water, which is all dried up now. But you can still see some of the water over here. I and mean, this is a real treat. This is like exploring, seeing this place for the first time. I mean, we are exploring, but it kind of gives you a sense of what some of the early explorers would have went through. Let's watch out for the wall that you're on there. Come in more. Yeah, there's a step. Watch your step. Yeah, and then go into the, yeah, go toward him. There you go. And we have one of these. Mortis. Tenons. There's a hole here, another hole. Recurring theme. The tenons that are up. Big, one over there. big, oh, big stone? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if that. Wow. This is really amazing to see this here. Really does give you a sense of what, again, early explorers, it's pottery everywhere. We wanna leave that alone to preserve the archeological integrity of the site. Don't wanna remove anything in situ. Stones here, one wonders what's still buried here. Well, I'm sure the locals have it all worked out. The archaeologists I'm certain already know. This almost looks like faience. Uh -oh. Piece of pottery. So all of this was the lake here and the water's rising over here and there you can see the temple fragments all around. Keepers were just telling me that this was all used for water, so that there was a water channel that would have ran along here to the temple in the distance. We were just at the sacred lake or lake over there. There's the temple, then you have this walkway, and then you have the remains of this structure here. 
of these tenons. Nothing inside. We have one here, one there. This one deep at the temple of uh, Hatshepsut, temple consecrated to Hatshepsut, we find a piece of ancient wood still in one of these. And then Luxor temple, we find some filled in that are probably more modern. Let's see, we have what? One, two, three, four, five courses of stone, six with the remains. That one, some more hieroglyphs. Beautiful rock. Makib. Thai. Makib. Need water? Mm -hmm. Come here. Stop. Uh, happy, happy, happy. Thai. Like a. Uh, Stop it, to stop the water, the Maya. Yes, no Maya, mm -hmm. stop. Kawas. Ah, shokran. All along here, I think you were saying water would run all along here. Well, they must have gone straight to the Maya, this walkway. Yeah. The vessel and this piece, definitely Coptic. motif so it's had Coptic occupation for sure and the keeper was telling us again that it seems like the Niles right back here that there would have been a water flow there was some sort of device here to stop the flow of water that would have flowed along here perhaps some water channels that would have went up to the temple proper here in the distance This is a site that few eyes get to see. Also a site that yielded very interesting treasure, which is in part in Cairo, but also pieces have been taken to the Louvre, which consist of uh, out of place artifacts. Take a look at these artifacts. If you study Egyptian art, material, and technique, you will know that they are unlike anything else in the archaeological record. And they are just a few of the interesting and unusual pieces that make up the Toad Treasure. The Toad Treasure was discovered on February 8th in 1936 by the French mission of Egyptologists led by Fernand Besson de la Roque, the French Egyptologist and archaeologist who excavated the Jedfri Pyramid at Abu Rawash. The team was excavating a 5th century mud brick church right here at the Ptolemaic Temple when they stumbled upon the Temple of Senwasret I, which we will take a look at in just a moment. Blocks bearing the names of Mentuhotep, 
indicate an 11th dynasty building, which was replaced by this new structure of Senwasaret I. And down below was the foundation base measuring 19 by 26 meters and a wall which had survived. Concealed in the stone foundation deposits of Senwasaret's temple, they had just unearthed a cache of 26 dynasty bronze figures of Osiris whom we discussed earlier in this video. Now, this type of bronze Osirian statue is not uncommon. We see them all the time in museums all over the world. But deeper down in the same foundation sand underlying the temple, four metallic caskets were brought to light. Some sources say that they were made of copper while others say bronze, but judging from the copper nails sprinkled around them, the chests had originally been contained in caskets of wood, which must have rotted away. Two of these caskets were 18 inches in length and two were 12 inches. The two larger chests were packed with lapis lazuli in both worked and raw states. Now, it's interesting to note that the best pieces, that is those that were in work states or were still intact, had in antiquity been placed on top so that this way they would be seen first when the chest was opened. The smaller casket had ingots and items of gold, as well as intact but crushed silver vessels and silver ingots and fragments of beads or cylinder seals from likely various origins in the Near East and dating back to the third and beginning of the second millennia BC. So some of the items such as the lapis lazuli came from as far as Afghanistan to the east as they would have been the source of lapis lazuli and others were originating in the Mediterranean to the west who would have been the origin of silver. Now the silver was made up of flattened ingots, ingot chains and coil cups that you can see here. The lid of the chest and front end panels contain the names and titles of Amenemhat II of the 12th dynasty. This was back in the Middle Kingdom. Now, I think it's possible that he deposited these goods in veneration of his father, Senwasaret I. Whatever the case may be, what we do know is that this treasure was containing unusual, out of place artifacts which would represent foreign trade between Egypt and other cultures. The mysterious origins of these objects remain disputed among archaeologists. But for the most part, the consistent hypothesis is that they were either Minoan or Syrian in creation. Some of the pieces contained in this treasure are exceptionally close to what we see with the Minoan civilization, like the artifacts that were excavated in Knossos, which date back to 1900 BC. I recently visited Knossos and uploaded a video about the sympathetic magic in stone found on site there, which you can find a link to in the comments down below. But the problem with the Knossos objects is that they were made of clay, which was possibly imitating metal. And if this were the case, it could only mean that the Minoans were inspired by another culture, perhaps to the Far East. The treasure was divided by the Cairo Egyptian Museum and the Louvre in Paris where these three pieces are now housed. By taking a closer look at the pieces in the Louvre, as well as reviewing recently published evidence about artifacts in the East, which is relevant to the toad silver cups, we can establish a connection to the treasure's Anatolian origins. Excavations at Toad are still in progress and the results to date have made it clear that the treasure was buried at a period no later than the reign of Amenemhat II in the pavement of the temple corridor, where it remained undisturbed until excavations by Bassan de la Roque and his team in 1936. Now, I do think that it's plausible to conjecture that a wealthy traveler from Syria, perhaps a prince, could have collected all of the pieces in the treasure over a period of years before being brought to Egypt. The unusual mixed nature of this collection suggests the possibility of a variety of different origins. And a study published by the British Institute at Ankara offers four possibilities. It could be loot from temples, booty from foreign campaigns, individual gifts between rulers, or a tribute to a victorious conqueror. The fact that many of the silver vessels were broken and crushed intentionally which the author believes is probably for recycling, would also suggest that the complete treasure was not intended to be a foundation deposit. They could have been dedicated to a goddess, which was common for cultures in the East. 
I'll leave a link to a paper going into more detail establishing the connections between the Ta'ud treasure and its likely Anatolian origins. Let's move on and check out the rest of the site. Yeah, so those artifacts were found in uh, the, the, the building deposits, I believe, like the part of the foundation or building deposit ritual that would take place during the building of the temple. What did you find? Well, yeah, you found the whole temple, Liz. Yeah. <laughs> to be unearthed, that's for sure. Hmm. All of this here. Hmm. The water, Maya, will go all the way here. Yeah. This is like a water channel right here. Yeah, you can see it. We come all here. Right up to the temple. Kibash. 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 Tariq Kibash. Oh, Kibash Road. Oh. Yeah. Ah. Oh, I see it. Yeah. So he's saying this is like the Avenue of the Sphinxes, El Kibash Road. So you have a plinth right here. You have one here. You have one here. One there. So this would have all been like, uh, wow, this is very interesting. This would have all been like an avenue of sphinxes right here. Like El Kabash Road. All along here. Very interesting. Right up. Bash. One. I would have been one here. I would have been another one here. Kabash, El Kabash Road, Ram Road is the avenue of the Sphinxes, which link Luxor to Karnak. I have another video here on my YouTube channel. Several videos on the avenue of the Sphinxes that you can check out under the Sphinx playlist. I wonder if this was some sort of smaller temple or go. Yeah, let's see this real quick. So this part here is Ramses. The Nile's in that direction. You have Armont and then Metamud, Karnak. So it was Karnak, Metamud, El Tad, Armont. And there was a connection from here to the Nile River, which allowed the water to come up. This is the older temple here, attributed to Mantu. And if you look at the foundation deposits, clearly on top, I mean, this had Coptic occupation without knowing too much, with just a little bit of my own understanding, a little bit of Egyptological context. I know that this is Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic glyphs. And as Lizzie was just pointing out a minute ago, if you look at the Ptolemaic glyphs here, then you have what appears to be a foundation here. But below that, we have this other course where you can see more of a, a Tutmosoid, Tutmosis style, if you will, the ancient Egyptian style beneath. All right, so this is the older stuff, attributed to the time of probably Mantu. Then you have this new uh, foundation here and then the rebuilding here of the Ptolemaic temple which is now in ruins but this foundation is very interesting it almost looks as though there's an even older foundation beneath if you see that zigzag pattern not zigzag but 
erratic pattern. And you can see the legs, the two legs that are cut off. So this, this would indicate that this is part of the older ancient Egyptian temple, which was in ruins and then they began building on top of it. So it gives you some bit of uh, insight into how temples can be built on top of temples and how even the ancients themselves, the ancient Egyptians like the Ptolemies were restoring some of the oldest stuff. And then clearly these mortises here, mortise tenons were, were from the Greek Ptolemaic times. We see a lot of examples of these in Greek temples. So this is it. El, El Toad, Taud, Tod, probably mispronouncing it, slightly mispronouncing it. Look at this stone over here. This is clearly part of the older temple. Amazing. So just to give you an example of how many layers there are, what may be buried underneath our feet. Here I am on ground level. And if you look here at these stones, this goes down, perhaps part of a nanometer, maybe to measure the Nile. This goes down underneath the ground here. That has a passage, a descending passage below the surface. Then over here you have the water. This is like what could have been a sacred lake. You really get the sense of what it was like, as I mentioned earlier, for the uh, early travelers just coming upon these ruins in the jungle. It's almost like in the Yucatan. You usually don't see lush vegetation surrounding the ruins like you do here at Taud. Don't want to go too much further, as we've already seen that. Uh, Profile of the temple here. one time cartouche there Min Kefara oh well yeah Min Kefara upside down so reuse repurposed stone Kefara Ramses 2 Ramses 6 Ramses 4 Ramses 2 and Ramses 4 so Ramses 2 and Ramses 4 and here, Mantu. Foundation. As you can see, we're just walking all over. Uh, there's pottery everywhere, pottery shots.
All right, everybody, this is NEXT. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. If you enjoyed this video, please consider clicking the like, leaving a comment below, and of course, subscribing for more videos like this one.